to talk to you all today about the future of work and how we can all be successful in it. Um, I'm going to spend the first half of my short talk on the way the world of work is shaping up. Um, and in our connected era, and with all the collaboration technologies that are emerging, we really are seeing the biggest change that we've seen since the industrial age. It's both exciting and scary, and, you know, um, like the robots that Iden talked about, you can have lots of opinions about it, but it is on the way. Um, and then in the second half, I will talk about what it's going to take to be successful in this emerging world. So I'm going to start with the vaunted sharing economy. Is there anyone here who has not heard the term, the sharing economy? I think we've all heard about it. We live in San Francisco. And we certainly know that the sharing economy has arrived when people talk about Lyft and Airbnb and Uber with the same breathlessness that they once reserved for Facebook. And when you have a two-day conference solely devoted to the implications of sharing like we had in San Francisco last month. But here's my first point to you today. When most people think about sharing, they think about sharing a thing like a ride or a empty apartment room or what have you. But actually, the most exciting aspect of the sharing economy is the one that we hardly ever talk about. And it's our expertise, our skills. It's our know-how, our talent, and the time we have to share it. So what do I mean by that? And how is this affecting all of us as we build and grow our businesses, many of you in the room today? Well, I'm going to explain this by actually sharing my own very first experience with the talent sharing economy. So I arrived at ODesk about three years ago, and we really needed some attention focused on our brand. Now, how many of you have ever tried to hire a great branding person in Silicon Valley? I mean, it's tough. <laughs> branding talent is rare. It's expensive. And I was tearing out my hair trying to get my branding project off the ground. So I logged on to Odesk, which as you know, some had said, is a site with millions of talented freelancers. And in a few minutes, look who I was shocked to find. In the hills of North Carolina, this man was retired. And he was sharing his talent just a few hours a week, but he was the former senior creative director from Bozell Advertising, one of the largest ad agencies in the world. And by his own statement, he was doing this work. He was sharing his talent in his 60s and 70s because he had these 12 grandchildren and he wanted to indulge them. So he gets to continue working, and I get the benefit of his talent. And let me tell you that this man actually, he saved me. He worked for me from North Carolina. He was brilliant at what he did. He was very quick. And I got the skills I needed to get the job done. So you can start thinking about what this really means for the way we work. Talent sharing can apply to anyone with skills and an internet connection. And for those of us that are building businesses, we can start to take advantage of that. It could be anyone from, let's say, might be a college student with 10 hours a week available to run social media campaigns for a company. Or it could be a mobile programmer who likes to moonlight on the weekends, or even a mobile programmer who's chosen this as a way of life, who might work from co-working spaces and cafes, whether urban, suburban, rural, or beachside, from anywhere in the world. And what it means is that as businesses, we can hire people like I hired Jim. We can do it even if, you know, we can do it much more quickly, even if the work we have doesn't justify a full-time job. So it really allows us to dip into talent as our needs arise and do so very, very quickly. Now, um, in order to really talk about how this future is shaping up, I'm going to talk about three major disruptions that are converging to kind of give you the picture of the way the world is going. And then I'll talk about the seven habits of success. So the first disruption, I think most of you know this, corporate loyalty is dead. I mean, it used to be that the average time was at a job was 10 years. It went down to seven. It went down to five. Now, last year, um, a recent survey of millennials, and the millennial generation is the generation, most of you know this, that was born after 1980. 
By the way, next year, beginning in 2015, millennials, for the first time, will be the largest generation in the U.S. workforce. For the first time, they will be bigger than the baby boomer generation. So what they have to say is important, and guess what they said? They said that they would spend an average, they expect to spend an average of two to three years in any given job. Think about that. So that's 15 to 20 jobs over a lifetime. Um, in fact, if you also think about what it's like to be a hiring manager, now we all know what it takes, or those of you that have hired know how long it takes to hire a really good full-time talent. Conservatively, it's about 45 days. I know, you know, 30 to 60 days is common. Well, imagine if every two to three years you have to spend 30 to 60 days filling the same job. Thankfully, the internet and collaboration tools and online workplaces are changing all of that. Now people can start to come together and work together, you know, in much more dynamic and fluid fashion. Well, what does that mean? This is a really, really important um, statement um, that I encourage you to think about, especially if you are an independent professional. And by the way, by 2020, between 40 and 50 percent uh, professionals are expected to be independent. So businesses of one are going to become the new normal. So what it means is now it's about employability and not employment. Professionals of the future will be thinking about, instead of having one job, they will be thinking about how to create diversified portfolios of, of, of an income instead of just one income stream. They'll be asking themselves, you know, do I have the right skills in a changing workplace? Um, am I at the top of my game, or do I need to brush up on the skills I need to be competitive? And this is a very important ongoing question as the world of work um, continues to evolve. Um, meanwhile, businesses, on the other hand, like if you're, I was told to stay away from that, I can see why. <laughs> um, if you're a business, you're going to start thinking more like a Hollywood movie crew. What are the skills I need to get the project done? And how do I assemble the ideal team of talent, the ideal cast of characters, to get the best result? So that's our first disruption. The second disruption is that social networks have changed how we hire. So really think about this one. You know, people are starting to share things about themselves that were unthinkable even 10 years ago. There's so much you can know about a person. An entire generation has grown up pouring out its thoughts and experiences onto a digital stage. And this goes to the very core about how you think about people that you don't know. Our mental models have shifted from, you know, all of our Iranian parents who told us, you know, don't talk to strangers right? <laughs> Those of us who've been around a little longer, that's our mental model. It is now shifted to vet, connect, and trust. And there's so much we can learn about people on social networks. You know, we can learn about their work, their history, even their work styles, you know, on sites like Quora and GitHub and, you know, even blogs. And of course, we've all done this. You can go on LinkedIn, see who you know in common, and get a backdoor sense of what they're like to work with, what are their strengths and weaknesses. I can honestly say that I don't hire anyone today. In fact, I don't even take the time to interview someone before I've done my detective work, and it's not that hard, and figured out what their strengths and weaknesses might be, how they might fit into my organization, who thinks they're good. And by the way, this has implications if you think about it, for how you curate your own social networks. I mean it for whatever reason, <laughs> you worked with so-and-so and you just didn't get along. You know, this is kind of a side tip, but I think it's an important one. Um, and you're connected on LinkedIn. Do you really want that connection to show up when someone searches on your name? Remember that anyone you're connected to could be asked about you. And likewise, if you're an agile hirer, you'll be asking about other people. So um, the next uh, point I want to make here is that traditional resumes are dead and online resumes are in. And what do I mean by this? Well, here's the resume of the future. And right for anyone to see 
It are your skills. Ratings and reviews help you figure out, you know, what kind of jobs people did really well in. You can see people's portfolios online. They don't even need to come in and necessarily show you, at least for an initial screen. And um, skills tests. Lots and lots of online skills tests now actually help you figure out who actually took the test and is at the top of their game in the particular area that you're interested in. And likewise, of course, if you're a professional, if you're one of the 40 to 50 percent looking for work, it's really, really important that you do this well. Disruption number three. The best talent isn't necessarily within driving distance. Audash earlier had this figured out. <laughs> um, the gentleman from Limbic who talked about how he had this distributed team around the world. And the truth is, this is not a new disruption. What's new is that we no longer need to be limited. This is an outdated issue now. And what I mean by that is that you can connect with anyone from anywhere in the world um, and have them, you know, have their talent come in house. So let me tell you this, when this light bulb goes off, really I think you can never go back. And let me tell you what it is. I work at Elance Odesk, it came up earlier, it's an online site for, we have millions of freelancers online and two million businesses that use these freelancers. Um, when we fill a job, the average job is filled within three days. And 25% of the jobs are filled within 24 hours. That means literally people are finding each other overnight and getting started on the work. So people are finding each other, connecting and disconnecting with such fluidity that work is actually breaking down into smaller units that people can tap into as their availability and their interests permit. So now let's take the next step in reimagining our lives in which our entire work can, is carried around on a tablet or a you know, laptop, and the people we collaborate with are literally a Google Hangout or a Skype video conference away. And this is the future. If I had to summarize it in just a few words, this is what I would say. Six words. Work, is that six words? Yeah, six words. <laughs> Work is no longer a place. Think about that. Like, how many of you have brought your smartphones and your iPads in today? How many of you have literally brought your office with you to the Persian Technology Entrepreneurs Conference? That's a really amazing concept. You can be absolutely anywhere to get your work done. For centuries, we had to take the worker to the work. You had to drive to your office. If you were, you know, Farmer, you had to go to your fields. You had to go to the work. Now we can bring the work to the worker. So let me give you an example. This is, this is very futuristic, but it's actually happening right now, so I'm going to share this example with you. There's an entrepreneur who uses Odesk, you know, an entrepreneur like many of you. He built his first company. It grew to 200 people. It was in New York. He sold this company, did really well, and now he started this company for iPhone apps. Really successful guy, but he decided that he didn't want his next office to be this gleaming office on Park Avenue or Madison Avenue. He wanted to travel the world. So let me show you his new world headquarters. That is his headquarters. He has 30 freelancers around the world. They're in Tunisia. They're in Turkey. You know, they're in New Jersey. And these people work for him. And this guy works really hard. He works long hours. He's very successful. His name is Jay Shapiro. But he is what we call a digital nomad. And we're seeing more and more digital nomads um, come out of this, this whole concept. Now, I can imagine what you're thinking, which is, you know, people that work remotely and, you know, by themselves and from home and in trucks <laughs> or whatever it might be, you know, that might be great. But what about all the interaction that nurtures our souls? I mean, we like being together. I'm really enjoying being with everyone here and getting energy from everyone in this room. And you know what? Lots of solutions to that are springing up as well. This is Beta House in Berlin. It's a co-working space. You've all seen them. We work in San Francisco. So people can come together. They can get energy from each other, exchange ideas, be with other startups. 
you know, virtual companies can, can, can work, or people can work side by side for companies in very diff different places. And actually, at my company, Elance Odesk, Samad and I used to work together, um, we all go into the office four days a week. And when I say the office, by the way, I'm talking about our Silicon Valley offices. We've got one office in Mountain View, one in San Francisco, one in Norway. We have offices around the world. But I'm talking about the San Francisco and Mountain View offices. One day a week, every Wednesday, we all work from home. And we save 20% of the fossil fuels we'd otherwise burn on a weekly basis. It's really my favorite day of the week. I get the most work done. So I'm describing this like I think this whole thing is super rosy. <laughs> and I know, of course, like any disruptive change, it's at all in how we manage it. Certainly, as a society, we need to come together. We need to figure out how people have their social safety nets. We need to figure out you know, how we can be sure everyone has good health insurance, how people can be happy and healthy in this new world. And I'm not saying we've got it all figured out, but this is the way the world is going. So I'm going to spend the second half of my talk talking about the opportunities and this, what I consider to be the seven habits of highly successful people in this future. Um, and I'm going to go a little bit back and forth, you know, because some of you are entrepreneurs building businesses, some of you are individuals. Um, so we'll keep both in mind. First is craft your brand. Now, earlier, Iden talked about how, you know, it's important not to do pattern matching and be like everyone else. But when it comes to your brand, here's what you need to remember. People do do pattern matching. Why? Because we get so many signals all day long from so many different companies. What is a brand? And by the way, I'm going to back up and tell you, Brand in and of itself could be a 45-minute talk, and it was really hard to distill it down to three or four slides. So I'm just going to give you, like, if there's one thing you could remember, what would it be about brand, or one or two things. So, but I do have to start with what is a brand? What is the pattern matching that people do? And what it really is, it's just a shorthand. Like, when I look at Campbell's tomato soup, my brother will know this, too, because he's here. <laughs> I, when I think of Campbell's, it's not about the recipe. In fact, like, I would never really buy Campbell's today. It's not organic. It's not in whole food, you know. But my brain goes back to when I was little and I was sick. Do you remember how mom used to give us Campbell's soup? <laughs> so these brand experiences get burned into our brains as what you expect in the presence of this brand. So as you set up your company, now or in the future, even if you're doing personal branding, I'm going to focus on companies. If there are questions about personal branding, the same things apply, and I can answer them later. Um, if, there's, if there's only two thoughts I can leave you with, these are them. The first is the importance of thinking about your brand in an emotional way. So let me talk about um, a technique we use at Amazon, and I learned this from someone who used to work for me. Her name was Debbie Scott. This is not my original idea. But I think it's very powerful. Um, rational branding. So let's take a brand. I don't know if anyone here has heard of Oil of Olay. It's kind of a, it's been around forever. It's this product for, you know, women to remove their wrinkles or think they're removing their wrinkles. So that's the name of the brand. So it can be XYZ company, whatever your company is. You know, and, you know, what are the features, attributes, and claims? And you certainly need to write them out, write them down crisply. If you can't write them down, you don't know what they are. But, of course, you do because you're great entrepreneurs. So here they are. And most marketers start, stop at the next step. They go, oh, we're not about features. We're all about benefits. We're really good at benefits. Here's a benefit. You know, the benefit is you look younger and more beautiful instantly. But you know what? There's actually more to your brand. You can up-level it to the emotional benefit. What's the benefit of looking younger? Well, you go deeper, and it's about the woman feels attractive and feels more confident. And suddenly, you're creating this emotional benefit. What I'm describing to you is you need to articulate this but be, because you can't speak to it until you internally understand it. And at the very highest level, there is one word that can describe your brand, one or two. And I can tell you what they are for Elance Odesk, and I could tell you what I think they are for Apple and other companies where they haven't told me, but I, I can intuit it. For this brand, it's hope. And really, when every 
everyone in your company knows that what you're actually selling at its essence is hope, you will see how subtly things change. The language changes. You know, the way you orient your entire company changes. You know what you're selling at its very, you know, um, at its very emotional essence. And I'm going to close the branding section. I really hate to do this because I have like 35 slides, but this is the last one. Um, with a reminder of something we all know, but I'm going to give you an example that I hope you'll remember. The reminder is that in this transparent age, you can say all you want about your brand, but your brand has to equal the customer experience. If you're not actually delivering on the thing you say you're delivering on, you know, within 12 seconds, it'll be up on the internet. Your competitors are participating in the conversation. Your customers are telling each other. Your employees don't know how to behave. If they're not embodying your brand, you know, every time someone sits on BART with your company's logo, they need to communicate your brand. So I'm going to talk about the company that I've worked at that I think has had one of the best um, commitments to brand that I've ever been at, and that was Amazon. And I was there in 1999 and 2000, meaning like seven, you know, th you know, 35 dog years ago. But this company has maintained its brand, and it's not an accident, and it doesn't surprise me. Jeff Bezos used to always say to us, we're doing, we're only about one thing, and that is building, you know, the best customer experience in the world. We're here to delight customers. He said it over and over. If you watch him on TV, he still says it. I used to always think, oh my God, someone's going to call him on it. Like, what's the business? But they never do. But this is the example I want to give you because it was so powerful. Because so much of brand has to do with how you orient your own team, whether they're full time in your office or distributed around the world. So it was the holidays, 1999. You know how Amazon or shopping sites will say you have to order by the 17th, otherwise you're not going to get free shipping, and then so on. 17th comes and goes. We decided to upgrade the shipping without charging the customers. I won't take you through, but each day goes by. Finally, it's the 24th. And there's no way. Like, anyone dopey enough to order on December 24th was not going to get their package, right? We issued the warnings. Well, guess what happened? The employees, and most employees went somewhere to travel, each took a couple of boxes. And they actually knocked on doors and said, Merry Christmas from Amazon. Now, in the age of Twitter, that would have lit up. It wasn't the age of Twitter quite yet. It was the age of internet shopping. But the reason I tell the story is, who do you think that branding experience really was for? It was for the employees. I mean, it was for the customer, too. We really did it for the customers. But here I am 14 years later talking about it because, you know, um, the power of having your employees truly understand your brand is really, really important, and that's what it's all about. I will move on from brand. Habit number two, focus on the 20%. Okay, so think of all the work you did in the last year. You worked really hard, you worked evenings, you worked weekends, and just take a mental inventory of all, everything you did, and then tell yourself what percent of all that work really had an impact on my business, really made more people buy my product. And you know, the truth is that there's a lot of work we do that's work. I call it motion instead of progress. Maybe we do it because we want to show our boss that we're working. Maybe things aren't going well and we just want to show everyone we're trying. But this is a really big deal. I mean, this construct that 20% of the effort gets you 80% of the result is true anywhere I've ever been. So, and this actually, some of the things I'm talking about are true of work in general. Not everything is changing in work. But as we get better and better at measuring results, it's important to focus on the 20%. Now, how do you do that? Of course, it's situation specific. But I really think this construct actually really helps. And when I sit with my team, there are days they come up and go, I have a great idea. Da -da -da. Oh, you're right. It's not part of the 20%. Like, it's the filter. <laughs> If you don't think it's part of the 20% of the effort that gets 80% of the result, take the time to figure out what is and focus on that. Okay, so this has been a big theme of the day. I am reinforcing the same theme. I'm going to give my personal anecdote. We've heard it over and over, and I cannot agree more. You know, when I first graduated business school, I had two job offers. One was with this database company for a lot of money, at least it seemed to me in that time. Another was this offshoot of Apple. 
And you know what? That 10K gap in salary seemed like so much money back then when I was in my early 20s. But thank God I took the job at the Apple spinoff. Because some of the people I worked with, they were just amazing people. They were creative. They were imaginative. They were innovative. They were smart. I couldn't wait to get to work every morning. And they went on to become Silicon Valley legends. And there has not been a single job I have gotten since then that I got because I sent someone my resume. These people, you know, good people travel in packs. They remember each other. The best people on my team now, many of them, not all of them, are people I've known from past jobs. The reason I love going to work is because I learn from them every single day. So prioritize people. You will never, never fail if you prioritize people. Of course, once you prioritize the people, three words, do good work. <laughs> they will remember you, your work is good. But I'm assuming that's the case for everyone in this room. Number four, evolve yourself every day. OK, so there was a time where you went to college, you got your degrees. If you got, went to a good school, it was great. You know, you went to work, and you did your job. And things didn't change that quickly. Well, skills trump degrees now. It doesn't matter. I find this really exciting, honestly. Probably the most exciting thing. Just like all of you are doing today coming to this conference. You have to evolve yourself every single day. We will be students for the rest of our lives. Recently, I found myself, look at me. You can see that I'm not a young person, in a course on Google AdWords. Why? Because my team, the younger people, know more about Google AdWords than I do. It was time to figure out how search marketing, nitty gritty, really works at the level that they know it. There is pride in that. Take pride in be being a student every single day. Skills shift. Right now, the skills that we cannot fill on Elance Odesk, it used to, you know, certain programming skills are a dime a dozen. If you know Swift, you know, if you're a data scientist, if you're a mobile programmer, there's no end to the jobs for you. Stay on top of it. In fact, I heard the most amazing sound bite yesterday on NPR. I have to share it. Somebody said, there's only one skill that matters anymore. I thought, oh, I turned off. I even had writers in my car. And that is the skill for learning new skills. Think about that. So, OK, so lots and lots of problems. We're always told, raise the red flag early. Be sure your boss knows. But never go, whether you're going to your board or you're going to your boss or whomever you are, never go flag the problems but always be the person who has a solution. I recently hired three freelancers on ODesk with this really simple job. I needed someone to give me minimum wages from around the world. But there was a flaw in my instructions, and the flaw was that every com country calculates minimum wages differently. So two out of, everyone figured it out right away, like they tried to do the work. I was actually testing them. Two out of three came back and said, whoops, you know, some countries do it by day, some by week, some are really weird. How do you want, what are your instructions? But the third one came back and said, everyone does it differently. Here's my recommendation on how we solve this. Who do you think got the bigger job, follow-on job? Whether it's a small example or a big one, like our SEO is tanking because our competitor is really good at it and thus and such and Panda and Penguin, figure it out, flag the solution, but flag the problem, but go with a fully worked out, or, or with a at least partially worked out solution, so you're part of the solution. Okay, this is for Adash. <laughs> Thank you, Adash, for taking it up earlier. I was really impressed with when you talked about your virtual company. I am not going to make assumptions, but what I think probably happened is that the most talented people you could find were not necessarily within 30 miles of wherever you happen to live. And you realize that in order to be successful, it was important to get the best talent, no matter where it was. Am I right? So think about it. Maybe there's an amazing mobile programmer who has to care for his or her aging parent wherever they are. Maybe they're in the hills of Oregon, you know, wherever they are. This can be done now because we have the tools. And Arash explained what some of them are. Google Docs, Dropbox, online video conferencing. You know, I have to say it, elansonodesk.com. You can do all of this stuff online. You can meet virtually. You can meet in person three or four times a year. People love it. Everyone is where they want to be. Some are full-time, some are part-time, some are contractors. 
Think outside the talent box, and then you can assemble a really great team. Your playing ground is 100 times larger if you think outside of the 30-mile radius of your office. But how do you do it? How do you build a high-performance culture, especially if your team is distributed? And this one, you know, we've given a lot of thought to at my company. We have 250 roughly full-time employees, and we have about 550 freelancers. Many of them have been with us for years. Some of them go in and out. Some of them just do small jobs. But if I had to say one piece of advice, and Arash already began to address this earlier for those of you who heard him, it's this. This is not for bad managers. <laughs> You have to be a good manager, just like you have to be if you're in the same office, but it's good management on steroids. Do the same things. Give really crisp and clear objectives. Write them down. I write them down anyway, whether even for people in my office, because if I've written them down, that means I understand them. Trust me, if you haven't written it down, often it means that you yourself haven't been crisp about it. You know, give people the praise that they deserve. Give them the raises they deserve. Give them the perks that they deserve. Build an infrastructure around it. So much like I imagine your company does, Arash, we set it up to accommodate uh, remote work. It's not very expensive. That every room has a large monitor. We have Google Docs. We have Skype. We use Slack. We even have etiquette around it. You know, my staff meeting always has at least four or five people remote. One of them's in Norway, etc. The etiquette is if a remote person wants to speak, they're given the floor first because it's very hard to jump in if 15 people are in one place. So, you, you know, you adapt around it, but isn't it worth it to be able to incorporate that kind of talent? We certainly think that it is. So, you know, I've talked a lot about how work is no longer a place. As I said earlier, I think of it like the robots that I didn't talk about. You know, some people like it, some people don't. <laughs> Some people think it's exciting, some people think it's scary, you know, some people think it's a mixture of all of the above, but it is the way the world is going. And it's a huge opportunity for both professionals and for businesses. But are you ready for it? Can you turn this into an opportunity? It's really up to you.